Sometimes one show just isn't enough. That's the case with Emil Haddad, the high-powered businessman behind Irvine's Great Park build-out and the ambitious Newhall Ranch project planned for northern L.A. County. We discussed that and much more business on our prior show. Now we get more personal and learn how Haddad went from shattered dreams in war-torn Lebanon to the American dream in California. It's an immigrant success story which earlier this year earned Haddad the prestigious Ellis Island Medal of Honor. More with Emil Haddad right now on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by... Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live, they are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Memorial Care is transforming the way healthcare is delivered, keeping our communities and businesses healthy by guiding them on the path to wellness with easily accessible hospitals, physician offices, and outpatient centers. Memorial Care, leading the way. Hi, I'm Rick Reef. We pick up our interview with a discussion of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. Emil, earlier this year you received the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. Uh, tell us about that. Well, it was a very uh, emotional and, and, and very uh, rewarding moment. Uh, it was a big honor. Uh, my family was there. Unfortunately, my dad and my mom couldn't be there, but everybody else was. And um, it, it was a moment where I think a lot of the uh, noise that we are hearing right now about what's wrong with our country just totally faded away. And what was right and what is right with our country uh, was right in front of you. Uh, a hundred of us uh, walked uh, proudly on Ellis Island. I was one of eight who addressed the crowd. And here we are, uh, uh, Fareed Zakaria of CNN is walking in uh, ahead of you in this picture we're looking Absolutely. at Absolutely, Chairman CEO of PepsiCo, uh, John Kasich was there. Um, so you had a lot of people who really have changed the world there. And when you look at that and you realize that that's what this country is all about, when you stand on that island and realize that 12 million people stepped, uh, took their first step on that island in this country who have really made this country what it is, uh, it's really, it was a great moment to remember uh, why we are the greatest nation on earth. And, and to be able to, to do it three days after uh, Dean and I were on the perch, uh, ringing the bell uh, at the New York Exchange when we took the company public, knowing that 31 years before that, we came to this country with nothing, and here we are, uh, was very surreal. Wow, and that was three days apart. So you take a company, Five Point Holdings Public, on the New York Stock Exchange, and three days later, you get, you're at Ellis Island for the, wow. Good year for you. Uh, maybe you got your Christmas uh, Christmas card photo uh, there. <laughs> you know what? It's a, it's a, it was a great year for me, but it was even a better year of to remind people that the American dream is still when and alive. Yeah. And I think well. I think we live in times when we need to remind people of that. Yeah. So let's talk uh, let's talk about your life story, and let's start by taking a look at a few family photos. Uh, and this first photo here is uh, your family in Lebanon. Well, this is a picture of our immediate family. I'm on the right next to my mom. In the middle is my late aunt who uh, lived with us all, almost all my life. And uh, she was my second uh, mom, passed away, unfortunately, three years ago. And then my dad and then my younger brother, who, uh, who he and I uh, were separated uh, for about nine years. He came to the States very early, and then we got reunited when we came here. So that's Lebanon. What kind of work did your, uh, did your dad do? My dad was an executive in a Dutch company that basically automated uh, poultry farms. And my mom uh, worked for First National Bank of Boston. She was a banker. So both, and a great both childhood in Lebanon, right? Wonderful childhood. OK. Here's another picture, a soccer team. And there, there you are in the back, in the back row. Uh, uh, so you were a soccer player. I did. I was. I was uh, on the uh, varsity at the college, uh, and this is a picture of the uh, team. Okay. Um, 
And, and here's then, another picture of you kicking uh, uh, in action. You're a lot of style there. You're looking uh, like almost like Pele. And this was not posed because uh, you can see that it was a real game. But uh, you know, soccer players, uh, we sit down and talk about all the good old days. That's all we can do. I haven't kicked the ball for a long time. Yeah. Uh, although I did see you kick one at the uh, opening of the sports complex at the Great Park, right? It looked like you could still. Uh, it, you were styling. I, mean, I, yeah. I did, yeah, and yeah. I was. I scared my kids and my wife because they always say I hurt myself now when I try to kick <laughs> the ball. So. Okay. And speaking of your wife, Dina, here's a picture of the two of you quite young. What is this picture we're looking this at? This is our engagement in Lebanon uh, a few months before we, we left. And uh, who's the woman there? And that's the her mom. The, so, that's uh, her mom, her your mother-in-law. Yeah, my mother-in-law. and. Uh, and uh, she's one of my best friends, her mom. Uh, she trusted me with her daughter <coughs> when, uh, when Dina was 19 to leave and come and join me on my journey over here. And, and I will always be grateful to her. Okay, so and now we're looking at a current picture of the Haddad, the immediate Haddad family. And uh, who are the two children in the picture with you and Dina? So my daughter, uh, Serene, is uh, uh, the oldest. And she has been working with us at the company now for, uh, for three years plus, graduated from USC. Uh, and then my son is a third year at USC, and he keep, keeps on saying that he can't wait to come and work with us. So it must have been that we've done something right that they Keep it in come the back. family. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know about public company is not a family <laughs> business, but they want to be in next to their dad. Okay, right. and, and so we go from that picture of you and Dina at the engagement and then the family picture here today, you know, and this folks would say, wow, that's the American dream right there. A lot of years in between and a lot of things that happen. So take us back to Beirut and tell us how things changed for you from this great upbringing you had. Well, look, I mean, I grew up in a city that up until uh, the war was considered the Paris of the Middle East, a uh, very metropolitan city, uh, buzzing city, and, and uh, life was great. And then on, on a day, uh, Sunday, April 13th, 1975, is when the Civil War started, and, and uh, everybody's life changed from that moment, uh, including ours. Uh, we lived 11 years in the war. Uh, and uh, saw a lot of things, and then we left. And, and I think that period of living uh, in the war is really what shaped my, my views on life. And I didn't know it at the time. I know it very well today. And, and it really, uh, I sum it usually to, uh, with a saying that I learned the difference between an inconvenience and a problem. And when you live in situations where you see uh, real problems, uh, and when you have a business setback, uh, th th those are two things that are totally different. So my perspective on life was shaped by that, as well as the fact that um, I was given a second chance when we came to this country. And I take that very seriously. And I take that responsibility very seriously. Uh, and as a result, um, I don't give up. I'm going to wake up every morning in the same survival mode that I had when I was growing up in the war, but apply it in a different way here to where every day is a brand new day and I have to go out and make sure that uh, I pay the debt uh, that I owe in terms of this second opportunity that we were all given. Talk about the, uh, that's powerful stuff you just said. Um, the adversity that you and uh, that you and Connor or that need to survive every day. Uh, what was that like? I mean, when you say survive, literally survive. Oh yeah. Uh, your life. Oh yeah. Literally survive. You know, I got kidnapped when I was 20 years old and escaped, and and uh, you know, got shot out many times. And so, I mean, the typical things that you see on TV in war, we saw all of that. Um, for probably more than two thirds of the 11 years, we had no running water and no running electricity. So to go through college and to live life and, and have to go graduate with a degree in civil engineering uh, using, you know, on a, studying by candlelight and things like that, uh, those were issues that at the time we were not even realizing how different they are. But you had this urge to keep on going because we knew that if we didn't, 
we're going to be obsolete. And, uh, and that drove us and, and created a very interesting bond uh, where uh, we were living uh, every day to survive the day, but we also had to plan for the future because we all knew that if we were to survive, uh -huh. uh, we had to uh, be relevant. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that's foundational in our thinking, um, standing in line for hours to get a loaf of bread or uh, things like that. Those are not normal things, uh, but those are the things that we had to do. And, and then when you come to, to, uh, uh, to the States and you have that in your mind, you can't just simply shake it off. It, it's always part of your thinking, and it's always part of you reminding yourself how lucky you are. Uh, and that's the thing that today makes me sometimes upset, is when I hear people complain, I feel like I want to take them and put them back in the life I lived for a while, or a lot of people who are still living there, and say, that's a situation you can complain about, not this. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I think guess, it helps. Yeah, so that, that helped you during the real estate recession when the company, some people were wondering if the Great Park would ever get developed because of the financial problems and everything. That's like a piece of cake. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is a piece of cake in terms of the, uh, the fact that you knew that if, you, if I stay with it and I have that much conviction and belief, we're going to get it done. Uh, and a lot of people would doubt that. But one of the things that you develop uh, when you live the life I live is a optimism, because if you don't have the optimism, you'll never come out of life. So you have to, to be optimistic and resilience, because uh, you have to be resilient. And I think those are two things that help me in, in business. Um, but I think, I think it, it's really more what drove me every day. And I think it's always the people I care about. Um, my immediate family it was my driver every day to make sure they're taken care of. And then as I developed relationships here, people who work with me, people who have put their faith in me, people who invested money with us, those are people who I had the responsibility of taking care of. And it's very similar to the same feeling you have when you go through survival, where I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make sure that those people are taken yeah. care of. So you said you, you lived for more than a decade in a civil war in Lebanon. How did you finally uh, get over here to the United States? Well, I, I had uh, wise parents who were uh, very uh, wise to get a green card uh, when we were very young. And I remember my, uh, my mom would always say that this is our insurance policy if we ever have to leave. And, and my dad used to always say, don't get comfortable because things could turn overnight. And so we had a green card. And I remember during the war when, when the bombing would start, my mom would always leave with a little pouch that had the green cards in it, the passports, and, and a couple of pictures. So, um, so we had a green card and we were fortunate to be able to then get on a plane, come here uh, as, as uh, residents, as uh, green, card, green card holders, and, and start all over. We, we came here, I, Dina. And you were ma married now? No, I wasn't actually. We were engaged then okay. because I didn't think I was going to leave. And then when we came, two weeks later, Dina, who was my fiance at the time, left her family. She came here and, and we, uh, we told the story not long time ago, or she told the story, that the first night she came, we had rented a small place and we didn't have power yet. The power turned on after she came. Uh, into the, uh, the apartment, and the only thing that we had was an inflatable mattress. Uh, and we started our life on an inflatable mattress, and, and then the rest of the uh, family came, and we lived together for five years and supported each other for five years. And I remember when I went to get our first apartment, uh, which was 1,000 square feet when we had our first baby, uh, Dean and I were worried about how we are going to make the rent. Uh, so we always talk about the fact that we were as happy back then when we had nothing as we are today. And we really, I think, learned a very important lesson that a lot of people unfortunately don't. And that is that what makes you really happy is not materialistic things. We got liberated from materialistic things when we came here with nothing. 
and realize that um, that life has a lot more to offer than uh, than money and toys, and uh, we talk about it a lot. Wow, and that's coming from a, a from a gentleman who has done very well for himself, very very successful. But you're saying you would be you were just as happy back then. I know because I was. That doesn't mean that having things is not a good thing at all, uh, but but it's not what defines you. Wow. So yeah, you uh, talk. What are some of the lessons that that uh, you've already referred to some of them? But going through the adversity that you did, what what lessons would you have for young people out there and for anybody about things they should think about or the way the the, the a good way to live? Well, look, I think that uh, the first thing that I would say is if I were able to come to this country with nothing at a time when people who looked like me were not the most popular and be able to survive and do very well, that means everybody has the ability to do it. Uh, I don't give a lot of advices to, uh, to kids, but I always say to them that they need to filter out the noise. Uh, we live at a time when they're bombarded with sound bites today and everything is moving fast and they are not giving themselves the ability to come to their own conclusions because the, the message is packaged for them and given to them and they're taking it at face value. And I would say, make your own decision. Uh, come to your own conclusion. Uh, work very hard. This is the secret to success in this country is very simple. You just have to wake up every morning and go and do the same thing all over again. No shortcuts and become an expert at something uh, and, and just do it every day. It's like building the pyramids. You just have to wake up every morning and keep on doing it and then one day you're going to end up with a pyramid. Uh, it's not that complicated and, and uh, you know when I speak to people about my life story it's not because people are going to live my life. It's simply to say to them that if you can come from where I came and do what what I'm doing today, that means everybody has an ability to do it. And if you don't, it's just because you put it in your own mind that you can't. Yeah. When you talk about the way you look and the way you uh, the way you speak, um, do you ever do you ever feel uh, do you ever get any sense that oh, I'm being treated like I'm an outsider? Absolutely not. Never did that. In uh, you know that question gets asked a lot sometimes, especially during the period after 9/11. And look. I don't view myself as any different than anybody else. Never did. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the reasons why people sometimes have this feeling that people are looking at me as if I'm different, it's because it's in their own mind. Uh, I don't see it that way. Uh -huh. um, I am as American as, as you are, and I have even probably more appreciation for what this country mm -hmm. has given me than people who have been born here. So the answer to your question is no, I so have not. If you, uh, so that takes care of America. Let's go back to Lebanon and the problems in the Middle East. Do you have any thoughts on that? You lived it, and uh, you're a Coptic Christian. Is I mean, that correct? Greek, by, by, Greek, by religion? Greek Orthodox. Greek Orthodox. Okay, so you're Greek Orthodox, uh, and a lot of Christians in Lebanon and, uh, and, and Muslims. Um, uh, a lot of different uh, sects. I, I misidentified you, but there. But That's all right. Okay. So uh, and and so how? What what would you do? Is there a way to solve these problems that people say are intractable? You lived it. You 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 know as well as anyone. Look, there is no quick fix to these issues. Uh, what I would do is what I am. I dedicate a lot of my time to, and that's education. Um, I think that you need to have education uh, take care of your issues. Education allows people to have tolerance and acceptance and understanding, and it's on both sides. Uh, that part of the world is a very complex part of the world, uh, and what you're seeing today is a product of you know hundreds of years of issues uh, that are people are trying to work through. Uh, we would take a whole, you know, segment of a whole special uh, one of your uh, uh, sessions here uh -huh. to talk about the Middle East. Uh, unfortunately, I I'm not that optimistic. Uh, 
at least in terms of the short term, in terms of what's going on in the world. Um, I am very up on the United States. I think that this is probably the most stable and best place mm -hmm. that you, uh, you can live in and invest your money in. Uh, but the Middle East is a very complex part of the world. Yeah, you talk about uh, education. Uh, you have been very involved in education. You're now the chairman of the Lusk Real Estate Center at USC. You've been the chair of the Irvine, uh, the University of California Irvine Foundation. Um, why that devotion? Well, like as I said, I mean, every problem in the world, in my opinion, is going to be solved uh, through education. And, and I don't mean academics. I mean education, the broader definition of education. Uh, today, when you have kids who are coming out of Orange County, of the bubble of Orange County, probably the first time that they come in contact with people who come from different walks of life is when they go to colleges, when they roommate with people. Uh, that's when they start developing understanding, tolerance, acceptance, um, and vice versa. So from my perspective, I think education is going to be the solution to whether it's curing cancer one day or curing this you know, issue that we're dealing with today of people not having any tolerance with other people who might think differently or look differently. And a world, I think, is gonna, not going to be at peace un until we have more and more people who, uh, who are tolerant and accepting. Which gets us to the millennial generation, which will soon, if not already, rule, rule the earth. Uh, how do you feel about the millennials? I always tell the millennials, and I, I think it's interesting because now we have to start talking about Generation Z, which is coming up right now. Um, I think this, is, this ha generation has the potential to be the best generation in history. Uh, first of all, I think this generation is very confident uh, because they have the answer in their hand. So they, they, can, they can actually have a discussion with people uh, and have the answers right here. So I, I still find that annoying about them. You, yeah, know, well, <laughs> you, you, you can find it annoying, but they don't. Uh, but i tell you what this is allowing them to do, which you know, I spend a lot of time with that generation, is they can now feel very comfortable having a discussion with people of power and people of ages, different ages. So it's actually bridging the gap of ages. When I was young, if somebody older would have told me something, I would have taken that face value. I was too lazy to go to Britannica and look at the answer. Today, they will challenge that. The other thing I think, this generation is going to be blind to a lot of the issues that have been anchors for previous generations in this country. They're going to be blind to color, to race, to ages, to uh, income. And I think they have everything that they need to really do things uh, that are going to change the world. And that's, by the way, that's all they do. They think about how they're going to change the world. The biggest issue for them is, is our fault was that we, uh, we protected them a lot. Uh, we gave them a trophy whether they deserved it or not. Uh, and as a result, when they get into the real world today, they're realizing that not everybody's going to get the trophy. And that's, I think, where they're going to have to find a way to adjust their thinking. You don't think they'll, they'll change the world so that everybody gets a trophy? No, I don't think the real world will ever do that. Okay. Uh, what better way to wrap up this show than to ask you something which I think a lot of people wonder about. They hear about your company, Five Point Holdings, uh, uh, or just Five Point. Uh, what does Five Point stand for? So in mythology, there are the five elements that, uh, that mythology says that's if the five elements work together, which is the five-headed star, which defines a pentagon in the middle, if the five elements are working well together, then there will be harmony in the pentagon. And what we do is we build places for people to live, to work, to play, to learn, and to connect. And if we can do a good job at making sure that these five elements are working well together, then there will be harmony in our community. I am so glad I asked that. <laughs> and finally, just very quickly, we have, we have about 15 seconds. Um, uh, you're such a great public speaker. You have so much to share. Uh, have you ever thought about running for politics? Never. I will not. My wife will, 
My wife says to me, I will either kill you or divorce you before you think about that. So and you've been through no. too much already to have it end that way. Sometimes Emil. I feel like I am running for office. <laughs> this has been great. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, Thanks again to my guest, Emil Haddad. And full disclosure, Haddad is a board member of PBS SoCal and his company Five Point is a sponsor of Inside OC. You can watch the show and past shows by going to pbsocal.org or rickreef.com. You can also catch our shows and our post-show open mic chatter on YouTube. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live. They are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Chapman University is a proud sponsor of Inside OC and community programming.